Good morning. There you go. You always need a friend like Lockie. So that when uh, the thing is on and you have to sing, that he will switch it off. Thank you. Thank you, Lockie. I owe you one. Let's just have a short prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, we like to thank you for this beautiful morning. We thank you for your love and concern and thank you for a Sabbath that we can rest of our normal work, dear Lord, and spend quality time with you and with our friends and family. Lord, thank you that you are the potter and we are the clay and that you are shaping us. Lord, as we open your word this morning, may it be your words spoken and not mine. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Isaiah 64 verse 8 says, Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay, you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. And when we've looked at this, this little video of the potter, I stand amazed to look at what people do with a piece of clay. I can also remember some years ago in Adelaide, I went to a part of the University Arts Centre and they had some pottery classes out there and they made the most beautiful pottery. Not only that, but they had some glass blowers out there and you see these people heating up this and then blowing through the glass and make absolute magic things out of it. And this is what God says. He says, I'm the potter. I can shape and mold you for the job that I have for you. But this morning I'd like you to take to the book of Jeremiah. And I hope we'll be able to read out there. Oh, I suppose I can turn my head as well, but I've just mentioned to, uh, to Richard there at the back that uh, I've got a new uh, pair of glasses and they tell me, you now have 20-20 vision. But let me tell you, when I try to read my Bible, I still can't read it. I need a special. <laughs> All right, Jeremiah 18. It says, this is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house and there I will give you my message. So I went down to the potter's house and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. You know, when, when you look at those potters, they take this clay and they, they play with it up and down first. And why do they do that? They try to get all the little hard bits and pieces out, if there is perhaps a little pebble or something hard in. Because the moment you have that in, it's going to give you a pot that's useless. It's not going to work. Which means you have to smooth it. You have to take all those little bits and pieces out. And we are kicking and screaming against it. We don't like that when God shapes us. I don't like it, maybe you do, but I don't. But I know it's necessary. And the same with Israel. Jeremiah 19 says, this is what the Lord says, go and buy a clay jar from a potter. Take along some of the elders of the people and of the priests and go out to the valley of Ben-Hinnom near the entrance of the potsherd gate. There proclaim the words I tell you and say, hear the word of the Lord, you kings of Judah and people of Jerusalem. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says, listen, I am going to bring a disaster on this place that will make the ears of everyone who hears of it tingle. We see this history of both Israel and Judah, where God warns them, he sends his prophets to warn them, change, but nothing happens. And so he comes to a point where he draws a line in the sand and he tells Jeremiah, I'd like you to go buy a clay jar. I want to use it as an analogy. Back to Jeremiah 18, it says, then the word of the Lord came to me, he said, can I not do with you, Israel, as this potter does? Can I not shape you as I want to? Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, Israel. If at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, 
torn down and destroyed. And if that nation is warned, uh, repents of its will, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. And if at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be built up and planted, and if it does evil in my sight and does not obey me, then I will reconsider the good I had intended for it. What do you gather from that? God says, I can shape and mold you. I can change. And in fact, if I have planned really good things for you, and you are really kicking up against this, then I might reconsider the whole process. Isaiah 29, 16 says, You turn things upside down as if the potter was thought to be like the clay. Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, You did not make me? Can the pot say to the potter, You know nothing? Isn't that what we quite often do? I know that sometimes we have children. And sometimes we like the children. Who is he to tell me what I need to do? Who is he to tell me this and this? And he says, so can the pot tell the clay? Who are you? God has the big picture and as he's building and shaping, he knows what he wants. Does he want an elongated one, a nice fat round one? Does he want an odd shape? He knows. He's got the bigger picture in his mind. We just the clay. How do we know? Isaiah 45, 9. Woe to those who quarrel with their maker, those who are nothing but potsherds amongst the potsherds on the ground. Does the clay say, to the Potter, what are you making? Does your work say, the potter has no hands? My sermon is not on evolution and creation today. But I certainly wonder the question. Isn't that what they actually say? Well, there's no God. It all happened by chance. Romans 9.21 says, Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for special purposes and some for common use? Thank you, Rob, for your insert. I love that. It just... Fit it in so beautiful. Yes, some of us actually find bone china coming from Delft or somewhere else. And some are just clay pots. Does it matter? God has a job for each and every one of us. And the size and the shape and the color doesn't matter. Is how do you fulfill that little thing that God gave you to do. And he talks to, certainly in the book of Jeremiah, he talks to Israel and to Judah about it. So Jeremiah 19.10, Then break the jar while those who go with you are watching and say to them, This is what the Lord Almighty says, I will smash this nation and this city just as this potter's jar is smashed and cannot be repaired. God sends a message to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the nation of Judah. The Israel, Israel has already been taken away. They've already received their judgment. And now we see the same thing as with happening with Judah. On countless occasions, God has sent his prophets to warn them. And now he says to Jeremiah, I want you to take this clay jar, take it there to the people and smash it. That's what I'd like to, them to understand that that's what's going to happen to Jerusalem. And so in Jeremiah 18 and 19, we see this very sad story of the demise of Judah and Jerusalem. And when you have time, please go and read it. And we see the end of it. We see that Jerusalem, or Nebuchadnezzar comes in, he smashes Jerusalem, burns it down. And he takes those people that uh, they have selected as exiles 
and they marched them all the way to Babylon. And if ever you have a chance in your world, your time, your life, go to the Pergamon Museum, and I'm, I'm sure there's some of you that may have been there. On the eastern side of Berlin, you go to the Pergamon Museum, and there you stand in front of the Ishtar Gate. This is what Daniel and his friends have seen when they as exiles came and stood in front of Babylon as they had to go in. And as they walked along the walls, they would have seen these emblems of the lions. And those of you that don't understand Daniel 2, I'm sure you'll remember of Babylon and the lions. But why did this happen? Why did this happen to them? Jeremiah 18 says to us, Now therefore say to the people of Judah and those living in Jerusalem, This is what the Lord says, Look, I'm preparing a disaster for you and devising a plan against you. So turn from your evil ways, each one of you, and reform your ways and your actions. But they will reply, it's no use. We will continue with our own plans. We will follow the stubbornness of our own evil hearts. You know, regardless of all the warnings, that they have received. They have taken the option to continue as they always have. Jeremiah 18, 15 says, Yet my people have forgotten me. They burn incense to the worthless idols which made them stumble in their ways in the ancient paths. In Jeremiah 19, 3 to 5, it says, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Listen, I'm going to bring a disaster on this, this place that will make the ears of everyone who hears of it tingle. For they have forsaken me and made this a place of foreign gods. They have burned incense in to, it, to their gods that neither they nor their ancestors nor the kings of Judah ever knew. And they have filled this place with the blood of the innocent. They have built the high places of Baal to burn their children in the fire as offerings to Baal. Something I did not command or mention, nor did it enter my mind. If you look at Jerusalem and you look at the valleys and you see this valley and this hill, you see the valley of Himnon right there. And you realize from where you would stand at the temple, you can actually look down on the valley and this is where they sacrifice their children. And so the question is asked, if you are the potter and you are molding the clay, can you reprimand as God? It's interesting, I've got a friend that, that really loves animals. And she struggles with the concept that there is a God that can destroy animals. Why destroy animals? If you look at the Old Testament, sometimes when they moved into, as they moved into Canaan, cities were destroyed and everything was wiped out. And she struggles with this concept to love a God that can do that to animals. But what can people do to their own children? The response of the people in Jeremiah 18:18, 18, 18, they said, Come, let's make plans against Jeremiah. For the teaching of the law by the priest will not cease. He will keep on doing this. He will keep on telling us off. Nor will counsel from the wise, nor the word from the prophets. So come, let's attack him with our tongues and pay no attention to anything he says. You know, they say the tongue has about 22 little muscles in it, but it's probably the strongest muscle in the body. It's the most dangerous one. We just read the book of James and we'll see that with our tongue we can destroy people, their reputation, everything with a tongue. Jeremiah 20 says, When the priest Pasher, son of Emma, 
the official in charge of the temple of the Lord, heard Jeremiah prophesying these things. He had Jeremiah the prophet beaten and put in the stocks at the upper gate uh, of Benjamin at the Lord's temple. Next day, when Pasha released him from the stocks, Jeremiah said to him, The Lord's name for you is not Pasha, but terror on every side. So now you see the man that's actually in charge of the, of the Lord's temple. What does he do? He takes the Lord's prophet and he beats him. In fact, they dug a pit and later on they threw him in the pit. And look what is Jeremiah's response. He's struggling. He's the clay. And there's little imperfections out there and he's, he's kicking against this because he's being shaped by the Lord. He said, you deceived me, Lord. And I was deceived. You overpowered me and prevailed. I'm ridiculed all day long. Everyone mocks me. Whenever I speak, I cry out, proclaiming violence and destruction. So the word of the Lord has brought me insult and reproach all day long. But if I say I will not mention his word or speak anymore in his name, I want you to listen to this. His word is in my heart like a fire. A fire shut up in my bones. I'm weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. That sets us apart. What sets us apart as people, as children of the Lord? Are we kicking and screaming when he shapes and molds us? I mean, Jeremiah was really, he didn't like this. But then he says, when I contemplate and think, should I just be quiet and let it go? And he says, no. It's like a fire that's in me. I have to say it. I cannot stop. He says, I hear my whispering. Terror on every side. They're mocking him. He's being ridiculed. Denounce him. Let's denounce him. All my friends are waiting for me to slip. Does that sound somebody that has a fun time being the prophet of the Lord? I don't think so. Saying perhaps he will be deceived, then we will prevail over him and take our revenge on him. When the Lord shapes us, it's not always an easy process. The product is great, but the process might not be that easy. But well, I like this part. It tells us about Jeremiah's faith. Despite what was happening with him, he says, but the Lord is with me like a mighty warrior. So my persecutors will stumble and not prevail. They will fail and be thoroughly disgraced. Their dishonor will never be forgotten. Lord Almighty, you who examine the righteous and probe the heart and mind, let me see your vengeance on them. For to you I have committed my cause. Sing to the Lord. Give praise to the Lord. He rescues the life of the needy from the hands of the wicked. That's what makes the difference. That faith that we have in the Lord. That despite what happens to us, even as Rob says, when that pot is being put in the queue and is being fired up, to make you strong, surely that's not nice. But there's going to be an end result that'll be worth it all. Jeremiah 22 says, this is what the Lord says. Go down to the place of the king of Judah and proclaim this message there. Hear the word of the Lord to you, king of Judah. You who sit on David's throne. You, your officials and your people who come through these gates. This is what the Lord says. Do what is just and right. Rescue from the hand of the oppressor, the one who has been robbed. Do no wrong or violence to the foreigner, the fatherless or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place. For if you are careful to carry out these commands, then kings who sit on David's throne will come through the gates of this palace riding in chariots and on horses, accompanied by their officials and their people. But if you do not obey these commands, declares the Lord, 
I swear by myself that this place, palace will become a ruin. Did they, have an, did they have a choice? Previously, we actually read, it says, can I not change what I do? If they repented at that point in time, God would most likely change his mind. Didn't he do that with Jonah? What I find amazing is that if we jump from Jeremiah to Nehemiah, where we see that at the end of the exile, what happens? When they come back, Nehemiah comes out there and he starts, he wants to rebuild the wall. You would think that the people have been in exile now for 70 years, and as they come back, that they would have learned their lessons. There's now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their fellow Jews. Some were saying, we and our sons and daughters are numerous in order for us to eat and stay alive. We must get grain. Others were saying, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards and our homes to get grain during the famine. Still others were saying, we have had to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. Although we are the same flesh and blood as our fellow Jews and Though our children are as good as theirs, yet we have not subject our sons and daughters to slavery. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but we are powerless because our fields and our vineyards belong to others. And if you go read the rest of the book, you'll see just how angry Nehemiah became about this. Because their own people exploited them out of greediness. And if we look at our, ten, of our commandment that God gave us, he said that we have to look after the widows. We have to look after the hungry. We have to look after the orphans. I read this yesterday and I wondered myself, how is it possible? We've just gone through this major crisis and we raised some funds. And the CEO of Red Cross had to admit that they keep a hundred, they actually keep eleven million dollars back for administration fees. So you would you be happy if you actually gave money to the Red Cross for those people that have lost their homes in fires? I surely won't. Jeremiah twenty one, the word the word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. When King Zedekiah sent to him Pasha, you remember the name? The man that beat Jeremiah, son of Micah, and the priest Zephaniah, son of Mishaiah. They said, inquire now of the Lord for us because Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, is attacking us. Perhaps the Lord will perform wonders for us in, as in times past so that he will withdraw from us. Isn't that ironic? When I came across this, I thought to myself, how arrogant. You've been warned by the prophet. You've ridiculed the prophet. You've beaten him. And in fact, you'll actually see, I didn't put that in, but he was actually thrown in a pit. But we see here that when King Nebuchadnezzar actually came and encircled Jerusalem, he suddenly called him and says, please, ask the Lord to perform wonders. Suddenly now that the danger is there, they were willing to make some changes. But Jeremiah answered him, tell Zedekiah, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, I'm about to turn against you the weapons of war that are in your hands, which you are using to fight the king of Babylon and the Babylonians, who are outside the wall besieging you, and I will gather them inside the city. I myself will fight against you with an outstretched hand and a mighty arm in furious anger and in great wrath. I don't want to preach a sermon of doom. It's not my point. But there are rules and regulations that we have to follow. And we have to listen to the warnings that God sends us. But I like this part, that we have a God of mercy. Because in Jeremiah 21, I actually see that he even gives them a final chance. They are actually besieged in Jerusalem. And then he says, Furthermore, tell the people, 
This is what the Lord says. See, I am setting before you the way of life and the way of death. Whoever stays in the city will die by the sword, famine or plague. But whoever goes out and surrenders to the Babylonians who are besieging you will live. They will escape with their lives. Isn't that amazing? Now that wouldn't have been easy. Because if you had to go through the door and out, you'd be seen as a deserter. Which requires death as well. So you just can't just walk through the door and go out. You probably had to sneak out or have some sort of plan to get out. But those people who were willing to humble themselves and actually go out outside of the walls would live. God gave them mercy. Moreover, said the, say to the royal house of Judah, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says to you, house of David. Administer justice every morning. Rescue from the hand of the oppressor the one who has been robbed. Or my wrath will break out and burn like fire because of the evil you have done. Burn with no one to quench it. The Lord is quite clear in what he wants us to do. He wants us to love our neighbor. He wants us to love him as our God, our maker, our potter. But he wants us to love our neighbor as ourselves. And if we don't, well, we'll have to struggle consequences. But there's hope. He says, Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to the shepherds who tend my people. Because you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not bestowed care on them. I will bestow punishment on you for the evil you have done, declares the Lord. As shepherds, are we actually helping people around us? If you're in a position of responsibility, what are we doing it says, I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and I will bring them back to their pasture where they will be fruitful and increase in number. I will place shepherds over them who will tend them and they will no longer be afraid or terrified nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. Isn't that comforting? Despite all of this, there is hope. If we remain faithful, God will personally gather his flock. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will, be, will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteous saviour. God is our potter, but he's also our saviour and our maker. And when I look at Ezekiel 18, it says to me what I need to do. Where do we stand? It says, therefore you Israelites, I will judge each of you according to your own ways, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent, turn away from all your offences, then sin will not be your downfall. Rid yourselves of all the offenses you have committed and get a new heart and a new spirit. And this is what I look at my own life. I'm not pointing fingers to anybody. I need a new, life. I need a new heart and a new spirit. Where do you and I stand today? When I look around us and I look at the news... And I read Matthew 25, it says to me that the Lord's second coming is at hand. Probably much closer than we can ever imagine. Do we have to say like the psalmist say, Lord examine my heart, see if there's any offense in me and help me to set it straight. 
Where do we stand in regards to our words and actions to people around us? What is our relationships like with our family, with our friends, our neighbours, our children, our colleagues at work? Are we perhaps like broken pottery that cannot be fixed? Have something happened to you that may have caused you to feel shattered and broken while you sit here this morning and you feel empty? Psalm 31 12 says, I am forgotten as though I were dead. I have become like broken pottery. I came across this a few years ago. The, I'm not sure whether I pronounce it correctly, but you go have it a go. Kintsugi, the centuries old art of repairing broken pottery with gold. Rather than taking shattered pieces of pots, they use it and they have a special little uh, sap lacquer that they use to mend it. But if you just use normal like we would glue or something, you'll see it very clearly out there and it looks ugly and you're not going to use that broken pot or something. A few years ago, a friend of mine, Adventist, a retired Adventist minister now in Adelaide, visited a, an elderly lady and she uh, offered him some tea and he accepted the tea and uh, he had a few sips but it was absolutely awful. He said, Carla, he says, I don't know what she had in there, he says, but you couldn't get this, thing, this stuff in your, in your body. He said it was absolutely awful. And she gave him also a piece of, of fruitcake and she asked me if he would like to have a second piece and he said, yeah, that's fine, thank you. And as she left the room, he took his cup, the window was open, he thought he was just going to toss the tea out of the window. But as he tossed it out of the window, the cup went and he sat with the first part in his hand. And he said to me, Carl, she walked into the room <laughs> and I couldn't explain what I'd do with this. How do you fix this? How do you fix those relationships? The Japanese came up with a way of fixing it and putting gold dust on it so that it would actually look almost creative. Don't you agree? Look at that. This unique method of using this particular way of fixing mended, I mean broken pottery with little gold dust to make it beautiful. Isaiah 1.18 God says, come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. My prayer for you this morning is that if you have something in your life and if I have something in my life that's making a wall between my God and myself. If there's a wall between us and our children and between us and our family members or colleagues or whoever they are, that we will go to the Lord. Even though we have shattered relationships, the Lord is able to fix those and mend it and sprinkle some gold on it to make it even look better than before. We just have to trust in Him. And that's my prayer this morning, that we'll mend so that we can be ready when the Lord comes to fetch us. Amen. We come to you this morning and we'd like to lay down our burdens at your feet. Because you gave us that promise and whenever we do that, you will sort it through in your own time. We'd like to thank you that you are our potter our saviour and our creator. Lord, that you are shaping our lives on a daily basis and sometimes it's not nice. But we know that the end product is going to be great and that you're going to use us for a very special purpose. Lord, we are looking forward to that glorious day that you'll be coming on the clouds of heaven to fetch us. Help us, Lord, that we can all be ready to receive you and spend eternity with you. Because we pray this, not that we deserve it, but in your precious name. Amen.